Welcome to TEN, the Tenant Experience Network. I'm your host, David A. Brooks. In this episode, we are connecting with Gary Phillips, Managing Director, Eastdale Secured. In this episode, we learn that Gary's career journey began working at Deutsche Bank, where he was assigned to an economic group focused on real estate. And so began Gary's residency in New York and his passion for the real estate industry. He attributes some of his success to his personal drive and nurturing long-term relationships. Gary has been exposed to all asset classes, but was able to share his insights into the office category and the challenges that it is facing with consideration to the different classes within the overall office class. Gary provided a glimpse into the current state of the buy and sell market, as well as the new players that are entering the field to take advantage of current opportunities. We discussed the need to continue to create and support thriving business districts in cities, and in particular, the importance of patronizing local businesses. Gary provided some interesting thinking about the new role of HR departments and their connection to creating physical spaces that help to achieve corporate goals. Gary sees the CRE space through an interesting lens, and I look forward to tapping into his expertise again in the future. We're excited to share this podcast with you. So be sure to subscribe to TEN so you never miss an episode of the Tenant Experience Network. And now I'd like to welcome Gary to the show. I'm really glad you could be with us today. I'm looking forward to our conversation. Likewise. Glad to be here and thanks for having me. Of course. Uh, so I'd love to begin with uh, a little bit about your journey to your current position role. How did you get started in the business? Sure. So a um, little bit of luck. Uh, and. Um, you know, when I first got out of school, of course, uh, 25 years ago, I was in New York and was uh, part of the Deutsche Bank banking program. And that's a, um, you know, it's a large class and they allocate people as they see fit in the different, uh, different sectors. And I was placed in an economics group that focused on real estate. So I um, uh, always uh, was, you know, my entire professional career was in New York. Uh, you know, focus on some aspect of commercial real estate, but started in an ec- economics role. So, so you were simply allocated to a group, and that set you on your career path. That's right. Yeah, I um, I didn't come out of college thinking I was going to work in real estate. Right. So I wanted to work in finance. I wanted to work in New York, and um, I didn't really have a preference, or even know to have a preference in in any respect. So. Right. Lucky me. Lucky you. Well, you know, I hear that sentiment expressed quite often where both, uh, A, the fact that they really didn't set out on a path to to end up in commercial real estate, but more importantly, B, how fortunate uh, they feel that they they did land there. And 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 for the most part, when they do land, they stay. Um, well, it, it, they either stay or they get weeded out as a certain breed of character uh, in our business. And uh, you either have the chops to hang or you don't. Right. Um, in terms of stops along the way, uh, you're obviously at East Hill now, but it, where did you begin and sort of what stops along the way? Of course, not too many, uh, but okay. um, I was on the principal side for the first 20 years. Uh, and uh, the first job was with Deutsche Bank, which eventually became Reef. Uh, that was the first four plus years. And then uh, I moved over to Clarion Partners on the uh, private equity side. Right. Uh, and um, worked in an acquisitions role primarily there for close to eight years, and then um, left there to uh, start Allianz's uh, North American uh, real estate uh, investing platform, uh, and uh, was there close to eight years, and mm-hmm. um, always flirted with the sell side of the business, and um, but a, a bit of a, a brand snob, and uh, you know I, I always wanted to. If I was going to make this move, uh, you know, East Coast Security was the place where I wanted to be, and uh, you know, made the switch roughly four and a half years ago, and it's been a lot of fun since. Tell me a little bit about the the company, the current the current role, sort of uh, uh, you know what their mission is, and 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 sort of what your day to day is. Uh, sure. So you know, we're um, a real estate investment banking and advisory firm that also does brokerage. Uh, I uh, co head our uh, New York business. Uh, but we operate as one seamless team internationally. Uh, so I get involved in a lot of our uh, processes, uh, client management, et cetera, 
uh, particularly around the country, but sometimes overseas as well, given what my background is. Right. But my day to day, day to day is, uh, it, it's, it's hard to say because it's different every day, but it's, uh, primarily, uh, interacting with investors and clients right. every day, uh, whether it's in person, whether it's on the phone, whether it's over Zoom like this, uh, preferably in person because, you know, that's where you, you know, uh, uh, make the, the greatest impact. Right. Well, it'll be through that lens that we're looking forward to getting your insights um, and contributing to this conversation. So I'm looking forward to to that. Um, and of course, congratulations. The reason we reached out is uh, you were announced as part of the Commercial Observer Power 100 list. Um, Thank you. So, so congrats on that. That's uh, obviously a great success and and a huge yeah. a, an achievement not to be overlooked. Well, it's um, it's a lot of fun you know, seeing that, but it's uh, it's really a, a team achievement. Uh, okay. You know, we're we're all uh, you know, part of a, a greater team here. So appreciate everyone that, that you know, helps get us that luck. Absolutely. Um, so, you know, again, you, you explained that a little bit of luck had something to do with it. But why do you think in the end you were so uniquely suited to this opportunity? What has helped you to be successful? Because as you mentioned earlier, you know, some people get weeded out. They might have been, you know, the luck might have been there, but they might not have lasted. So wh why you? What, what's contributed to your success? Um. Interesting question because I've never really had to think about it. Um, but it's, yeah, you know, it, it comes down to, um, you know, drive. Uh, you need also, you need to be able to have the financial shops, mm -hmm. um, to cut it. Uh, and then it comes down to relationships and appreciating what that really means and, uh, creating, nurturing, uh, and, um, you know, really maintaining those long-term uh, relationships, which you, you, it's hard to get to um, the top of any part of this business uh, without it. You know, everyone says that their their industry is a relationship-driven business, but real estate, uh, it's it's truly the most important aspect. Right. Uh, and um, yeah, so I think uh, you know, appreciating that at an early age, um, you know, certainly helps. I totally get that. And I think, uh, you know, a great insight for our listeners, the value of creating those relationships, you know, as early on as possible. Um, and I do agree with you that in this industry in particular um, is very uh, relationship driven. Um, and uh, that being said, you know, maybe we need to figure out also ways to sort of open up those maybe pr those barriers where not everybody has access to those kinds of connections and, and network and and how do we give more people opportunities. So, you know, a, a balance, I think, would be in order. That's right. You've gotta, um, you you got to push to uh, to make those connections. Yeah. And, um, you know, fortune favors the bold. There you go. Um, I think we can both agree that commercial real estate has just gone through one of the most turbulent periods of time that uh, we, I can certainly remember. Um, I've been through a couple and, 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 you know, we know the commercial real estate, the largest asset class in the world, um, but it has, you know, just gone through a period of time with prolonged periods of historically right. low levels of occupancy. And it's now really rethinking itself. It's really trying to figure out how does it meet the needs of people um, going forward? How does it deliver great space and service? Um, we believe that uh, the physical workplace is now much, or physical workspace, sorry, is now much part of a much larger workplace ecosystem. Um, and so we need now to compete with people working from anywhere, uh, co-working space, a local cafe, vacation destination. Maybe you're, you're going away on vacation. Maybe you'll do a little bit of work while you're out of town. Um, so just interested in your perspective, particularly through your lens, through the buy and sell lens, as to how the industry is responding to these emerging needs and rethinking itself. What, what are you seeing? Well, I'm, I'm curious uh, to see, you know, your first comment was that we just emerged from, uh, <laughs> I think we're still in it. And, okay, uh, fair enough. Uh, you know, and it's um, where you're seeing most of the structural and secular change is really in one asset class uh, within commercial and its office. Yep. Uh, I, I do think that, um, uh, Primarily, like everything else, multifamily, uh, logistics, even retail, uh, you know, are exhibiting very strong fundamentals and are going through um, changes that really uh, that are capital markets driven with regards mm -hmm. to higher interest rates, availability, and cost of debt. 
um, but investor sentiment uh, and the uh, demographic fundamental tailwind are all still there for those sectors. Um, office is a completely different animal. Uh, and uh, while it's the largest asset class, so it's super important, um, it, it is definitely um, going through some changes that the other asset classes are not. Uh, and um, you know, when you when you narrow down, um, when you when you narrow it down to um, just office, it, it actually there's there's different um, asset classes within the asset class. If that right. uh, you know, if, if that makes sense. Uh, brand new construction, the high end luxury side of the market is definitely flying above the storm clouds. Uh, we're seeing uh, you know, strong leasing activity within that space. Uh, there's still uh, not a sort of vibrant financing market, but there is a financing market, uh, mm -hmm. and the equity capital markets are still there. Uh, now that's been repriced similar to uh, you know, the rest of the commercial real estate world, um, but uh, you know it's still liquid to a degree. Right. Um, there are segments of the office market that are likely going to see, um, you know, I hate to use the word uh, permanent, but there's uh, there there will be equity um, that likely never comes back. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know these are uh, uh, B and C properties that uh, are not not close to transit, uh, are not um, don't meet the physical characteristics of what. Tenants want today with regards to light and air, core depth, et cetera, right. yep. um, but also aren't necessarily viable for alternative uses. Right. Uh, you know, whether that's converting into residential, to life science, to storage, or other um, asset classes that are uh, um, going to be more, uh, uh, more financeable uh, mm -hmm. and, and uh, you know, certainly would serve a need uh, for for many of these urban markets. You know, I, I agree with you around the BNC um, space, and we do have some BNC buildings using utilizing our platform, our technology in Manhattan, you know, helping to deliver a better experience, helping to digitize the customer experience and and compete yep. to your point with that flight to quality and and position themselves as as you know tech you know technology forward and 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 really trying to to change their game. And and in some cases they're fully leased and doing quite well. But to your point, uh, there are a lot of other buildings that likely, you know, perhaps aren't in desirable locations or aren't in proximity to to transit, and 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 then if they and if that conversion opportunity doesn't exist, you know, it's sort of well, what next for them? Um, so yeah, I think that's right. And then you have an entire segment of the market that just has been repriced and with um, it's not refinanceable uh, in its current state. So it's going to require fresh equity uh, and a uh, what we're likely to see is a complete market repricing for a large segment. Mm -hmm. So from a, a buy sell sort of activity level, what, what, you know, over the last, let's say 12 months, what kind of trends are you seeing? Is, 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 is there more, obviously, is there more or less activity than perhaps 12 months earlier and sort of in what spaces? Um, so speaking for office, uh, it's yeah. a quicker conversation. Uh, it, it's, uh, you know, sales activity are, is, Tremendously down. Uh, yeah. Depending on the market, uh, you know, it's anywhere from you know, sixty to eighty uh, percent, and you know that's driven uh, quite a bit by you know one investor sentiment, but uh, you know two, um, uh, you know the, the lack of uh, uh, of a functioning financial market for that asset class. Um, where we have seen buyers, uh, you know, primarily been users, which is sometimes very hard to predict. But also mm -hmm. private high net worth who are um, not beholden to an investment committee uh, or um, you know, necessarily running you know 100 different sensitivities on you know a whole period IR analysis. Or, you know, they're not running a DCS. They are focused on really two main metrics, and that's going to be basis and yield on cost. Right. And they're looking at you know they're looking at this as um, New York is. You know, cheap once every you know a decade or two, right. uh, and this is an opportunity to um, to acquire real estate that otherwise would not have been available to them, uh, mm -hmm. and then, you know, that they can hold for you know decades to come. 
so in, in some respects, it's just generational opportunity to acquire office uh, product at a, um, you know, in some cases, low land value. Right. Uh, so are you seeing new buyers, new buyer groups emerging? Are you seeing existing companies create no opportunity question. funds? Like who, who's sort of at the table? Right now, it's uh, primarily you know the, the bid sheets, which are not uh, you know you don't have to scroll to the second page. And it's it's um, uh, primarily those uh, private buyers and high net worth. We do expect some of the institutions to come back uh, between now and year end. Mm -hmm. uh, I think some will be announced pretty soon. Um, and uh, but it's going to be primarily groups that are um, that have mandates to acquire you know value add office it's not going to be necessarily the large uh u.s pension funds or um, right. or odyssey funds uh that are coming back you know can be roaring back to the market we think that's probably a few years out they are all overweight office right now right so they're likely to be sellers over the next 12 to 24 months uh but we think it's going to be um you're going to see some institutional groups return to the market because the the yields and the uh, the BNCs are just going to be too attractive. Right. And do you think in the BNC space that there there are a lot of players just sort of hanging on? They haven't necessarily started. You know, they haven't promoted the fact that maybe they're looking for potential dispositions. Um, or are you seeing is there more inventory on you know available now, or or is it still relatively low and kind of you're waiting for that storm oh. maybe to hit? Well, there isn't much. Uh, product on the market right now. I think that every office building is likely for sale. Right. Um, but not uh but not necessarily on the market. Um what we're likely to see uh where we're likely to see deal flow over the next six to twelve months is from uh one's gonna be lender driven uh sales activity, whether that's a loan sale, a short sale, mm -hmm. or uh, a refi that comes up where the existing sponsor isn't looking to put in fresh equity in order to effectuate a refinancing. Uh, so they're going to be, uh, you know, uh, forced to sell based on that maturity. Right. Um, or uh, you're going to see some of these um, Odyssey funds, uh, the large institutional investors that are overweight office, uh, rip the bandaid off. Uh, their internal marks are going to get to a point where they, it narrows to, um, Pretty close to where the spot market is, where they can justify the sale and redeploy the capital into uh, higher conviction asset classes. So, right. uh, you know, the, the, um, you know we, we have a you know, we have a building on the market right now uh, that's you know is exactly that situation. I think we'll see more of it. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of the buyers, are you know when you're when they're looking at properties. But are they looking? At, you know, obviously we're we're very connected to the technology world, and we think that technology can be you know a tremendous equalizer in helping to you know position buildings and, and help bring people back and engage people in a completely different way. So, are you seeing buyers looking beyond the physical and thinking about you know how these buildings are run or what technology may or may not be available to help engage with the tenants? Any conversations around that you know as you're moving forward? Um, is your question more around like the, the buildings that are less in favor and how you can retrofit it to? Um, it's an interesting question. Not yet. Okay. Um, we, uh, you know, the focus has primarily been around, uh, okay, can I buy something in Midtown or near Grand Central at uh, what it would have sold for 20 years ago? Right. That, is, that has been more of the focus uh, where you have some of, um, uh, You'll probably have some sharp uh, tech-driven investors that will be that are looking. They're monitoring the market. Mm -hmm. um, I can think of a few. Um, they haven't pulled the trigger on anything yet, but um, but that's something that I I wouldn't be surprised to see right. you know, going forward. But the focus today uh, and then from the you know from most of the larger institutions is going to be around the physical attributes. Can I attract tenants to the office here? Right. Uh, and in my close to transit. Right. Um, you know, we think a lot about uh, buildings and their place in neighborhoods and cities. And I think New York obviously is like just a tremendous case in point to this um, that, you know, we, we can't see buildings as just siloed, as independent from the neighbors and cities in which they're um, in which they serve. And I'm just wondering about your thoughts, sort of the responsibility or the opportunity for you know buildings and workplaces, the role that they play in helping to create larger and more connected communities and cities, and and obviously bringing back the cities just has so much 
so many different yeah. financial implications and economic implications. No, no question. It's a sense of place. Uh, and, you know, we've, we've been coming to the office since July of 2020. Uh, so we've seen, uh, you know, it's certainly ebb and flow with regards to, um, you know, the return to work phenomenon. Uh, but, um, you know, it's when, um, when we are back at normalized occupancy and we're, we're, we're getting closer, we're, um, mm-hmm. you know, depending on the day, it feels like Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday are the most active days. Uh, Midtown's very busy. Yeah. It feels like it, it feels like it, um, it did pre pandemic. Uh, it's hard to get a reservation. Uh, mm-hmm. you know, for the staff, uh, you know, lunch spots, the lines are at the door. Yep. Uh, and then when you're walking up and down Park Avenue or Madison or Dean Seth or Six, you know, you're running into, uh, you know, several people, um, you know, on the way to a meeting. So it's, um, you're, uh, in many respects, it feels like it's back. Uh, now you ask the, uh, you ask the retailers and the, and the restaurants, they may say a different story, but it's just from a, um, a feel on the street. And a vibe and energy level, uh, you know, the, I would say the city center, you know, feels like, uh, we're back to the pre pandemic. And that's super important. Um, we want, um, we don't want people coming to work and feeling like they're the only people coming back to work and that it's a ghost town. Uh, we want the, uh, the amenities to thrive. We want the small businesses to thrive. And frankly, we don't, not just want them, we need them to. Uh, and that's really the importance of bringing people back to, um, to the office on a more regular basis. I don't know if it's three days is going to cut it. Uh, really? you know, we, we need these, um, the small businesses and entrepreneurs and restaurateurs to, uh, to thrive in this environment. And the only way to do that is to have a thriving business sector as well. Yeah, I, I agree. And I was in New York uh, just a couple of weeks ago, and I'll have to agree with you that, uh, Midtown was was packed, busy, uh, thriving, energizing. Yeah. It was, um, you know, hard to walk on the sidewalk. People lined oh. up at every corner out of a restaurant. So I agree. And and it's night and day from some of the other major urban markets, uh, you know, around the country. Right. Uh, and um, so we're, we're we always like being the flag, uh, you know, mm. the flag bearer uh, here in uh, in Gotham, and uh, <laughs> you know, we're we're happy that we're um, hopefully at least leading charge on uh, you know return to normalcy. Yeah, for sure. All right, uh, let's take a short commercial break, Gary, and we'll be right back. Sure, thanks. This episode of Ten is proudly brought to you by Hilo. Hilo is a rapid deployment workplace engagement platform for the hybrid world that enables building operators to connect to their tenants, whether they're at work, at home, or anywhere in between. We are in the midst of a seismic shift in the evolution of the workplace. Now more than ever, it's clear that the most important asset of a building is the people. Commercial real estate leaders recognize that tenants and employees want new kinds of spaces, services, and amenities to support having the flexibility to work from anywhere. Workplace engagement solutions that connect hybrid working people to buildings no matter where they are have become a major differentiator as buildings compete to retain current tenants and attract new ones. Hilo empowers building operators to meet this challenge. To learn more about Hilo and schedule a demo, visit HiloApp.com. And now I'd like to welcome back to the show Gary Phillips, Managing Director, East Still Secured. Uh, Gary, once again, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you, David. Uh, we talked a little bit about technology, um, but I'm just curious, you know, we're certainly seeing technology take playing a significant role in reshaping how building operators are delivering great experience uh, for their tenants and, and also impacting operations of their buildings. Um, workplace engagement um, is obviously becoming um, some a, a very important discussion, um, uppermost in everyone's mind. I'm just curious, you know, as through the lens of buy and sell, you know, what are you seeing people talking about in terms of recognizing that we need to engage people in a different way. If, we're, if, if the workplace, the physical workplace is going to compete and it's going to be a place where people want to be, um, mm-hmm. what, what are you seeing, first of all, from a technology perspective, perhaps, that's contributing to that? Um, and, uh, and, and again, just helping to um, position buildings as, as the, the place to be. I think much of that technology is going to be centered around the amenities within the building. If you're, you know, strictly speaking from a landlord perspective, now obviously tenants are going to have their own, uh, you know, programs, uh, within their spaces. Um, 
but a lot of that's going to be focused on, uh, you know, I think the amenitization of, of, of these assets. And some of it's not going to be technology driven. It's just going to be, you know, human nature driven. And that's going to right. be activating outdoor spaces, creating, uh, you know, senses of community within a building. Uh, you know, we've seen some, uh, office landlords, uh, build out amenity floors that almost, that feel like a private club, which has right. become a, you know, an increasing trend here in New York and other parts of the world. Uh, so I, I, I think that's going to be a trend that's going to be here to stay and uh, is not always going, going anywhere. But it's, um, you know, companies are, you know, they're viewing their office space as uh, it, it, it's become part of the HR budget. And right. you are you need to create a place that people want to come to, people want to congregate at. Uh, and um, and not only for recruitment, but also for you know, uh, talent retention. Yeah. Uh, and, um, you know, there's everyone has a different opinion on this. Um, but I, I, I believe that, um, people are most productive when they're around other people. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, uh, so get it. So employers, uh, finding ways to incentivize their employees without, um, you know, using the stick, uh, you know, having them come into the office at a regular rate is, um, I, I think it's going uh, it's going to provide dividends. Uh, you know, going yeah, I, I agree. And I think those incentives are not only, you know, free lunch and, you know, some of those bells and whistles, but I think it's, you know, reimagining space itself and the way in which space now provides value and benefit to their employees. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think, you know, if you can create unique situations and unique opportunities for people, they're going to want to be a part of that. Um, no question. And, and I think at the upper end of the market, uh, it, it has it's going to be less price sensitive too. Right. Uh, because if you think about it, um, if you, you know, the rent is a, is a much smaller fraction of uh, a company's budget than their uh, payroll. Right. <clears throat> and if you can create an atmosphere where you're getting more productivity out of that uh, very large uh, expense item mm-hmm. by incrementally increasing a much smaller uh, you know, part of the overall pie, uh, it makes a lot of sense. So I think that um, uh, you know, to have the right space, you're going to see. Uh, you know, I, I think you're going to see landlords be able to push rents, uh, you know, uh, to limits that they didn't. Uh, you know, that that will exceed their expectations. Right. I, I like your um, sort of drawing the dotted line now between uh, you know bringing HR into the conversation um, and that the physical. I never, I never like to bring HR into the conversation. Uh, <laughs> I, I know, but I think, but I think you're right that, and I think actually HR departments have taken on a whole new value, purpose, and role within companies. It used to be about processing, you know, payroll and 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 providing you know health benefits. Um, I think that the HR role has taken on a much wider you know view and 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 does now connect intrinsically to the space and creating those kinds of opportunities and and using no space as a way to engage their people and and build culture and. Yep. Um, and get the best out of them. So it's, it's become a vital part of the C-suite across the board. Right. Uh, mm-hmm. And uh, in some respects, uh, we should all consider ourselves uh, human resource managers. And, uh, it's uh, uh, it, it's vital to the success of any company. Yeah, I agree. Thank you for sharing that. Um, our closing speed round is an opportunity to get to know you, Gary, a little bit better. Um, so when you're not at work, what do you enjoy doing? Um, well, I've um, love hanging out with my family and my uh, my dog. Uh, okay. I live in the Upper East Side of Manhattan, so we uh, we enjoy everything that the island has to offer. Uh, go out, uh, eat out a lot, um, and uh, love Central Park. Right, awesome. Um, what is your favorite drink of choice? Hot, cold, alcoholic? Um, well, I appreciate a well-made martini. <laughs> um when the when the time is right and then okay. um uh love wine collect right. wine passion well my, myself as well so we can talk about that sometime either another episode all about yeah. wine or over or over a nice bottle i love that that's great uh favorite uh movie or current tv series that you're watching um favorite movie or current tv um well, um, I always ex- actually I like to ask this question to people: is if you're on a deserted island, uh, what three movies do you bring with you? Right. Um, you learn a lot about someone when you see their video collection. Um, yeah. But uh, The Big Lebowski is probably my favorite movie. I've 
seen that more than any other movie by a large factor. Right. Okay. Um, name one way in which technology has improved how you live or work. Uh, what we're doing right now. Yeah. You know, it's um, greater flexibility and optionality. Uh, I'm able to reach, we are able to reach um, more people um, in a day than we used to. And, um, you know, instead of running around, you know, we're able to you know, have meetings like this, uh, you know, on the regular. So, um, yeah. yeah, I think uh, being able to provide that flexibility, but also being able to harness it's been, uh, you know, uh, being willing to adapt to it has been super important. Right. I, I agree with you. I like the word optionality. For, for me, what I've learned is it's not always, but it sure is nice to have. Yep, exactly. Yeah. I think what we learned is that uh, we um, uh, we can work remotely for a period of time if we have to. Yeah, agreed, agreed. Yeah. And, and going forward, I think that it's nice to have that flexibility. So um, sure. to me, uh, I really, I, I'm not to, you know, take the middle road for the sake of, of not creating controversy, but um, I really do believe that the, the the opposite ends of the spectrum, you know, mandating versus, you know, 100% remote, I really don't think, think those are the right um, options. And I do think giving people flexibility, and I don't think it's saying you have to come back three days, three days is still being a mandate, but if people find their way back to three days and sometimes four and sometimes five and sometimes one, you know, that's all good in my opinion. Right. Well, the beauty of the three-day work week is that you still need the same amount of office space. Right. True enough. True enough. Um, what is your personal choice for days spent in person working with your colleagues versus working from anywhere? Oh, uh, 10 out of 10 uh, in, the, you know, in the office working with my colleagues. Right. Yeah, I'm, okay. I'm not very, um, I'm not good at working at home. I, uh, I'll be distracted too easily. Uh, and then, you know, run errands, et cetera. Uh, this is um, uh, much, I'm a thousand times more productive when I'm in the office and surrounded by my teammates, but also, uh, you know, clients. I think that's a great, you know, testament to the fact that it's not one size fits all. Um, and we should not be prescribing what everyone ought to be doing because it's, you know, there's some people even during the early days of, of COVID that, you know, were very uncomfortable working from home, either, you know, small apartments yep. and, you know, right. poor, poor working conditions, and they they would have done, preferred nothing more than to have come back much sooner. So it is not a one size fits all, and I think that creates a tremendous opportunity for the industry. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, I'm I'm excited to see where this this continues to how it continues to evolve. Thank you so much for coming on our program today. I hope that this is the first. Thank you for having me. Uh, my pleasure. I hope it's the first of many conversations that you and I have. I look forward to my next trip to New York and perhaps getting together for that glass of wine. Love to. Okay. Thanks, thanks Gary. Lot, Take care. Bye now. Bye. I want to thank Gary Phillips for joining me on this episode of 10 and for contributing to the global conversation around buildings being a part of a robust ecosystem, helping to build great companies and that they are vital in the effort to cultivate and support great people and teams. The future of the workplace will likely take many forms and we will continue to explore what that looks like together. Subscribe to 10 for more conversations with leading CRE industry professionals and experts who all have something to say about tenant experience and the future of the workplace. We love hearing from you. So if you enjoyed this episode of 10, please share, add your rating and review us through your preferred podcast provider. If you or someone you know would like to be a guest on a future episode, please reach out to me directly at david at hiloapp.com. And until our next episode, I wish you all continued success in building community where you work and live. Thank you.